Welcome to another In Wheel Time podcast, a 30-minute mini version of the In Wheel Time car show that airs live every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central. Like Elvis's Hawaiian concert. It's his birthday. It's the worldwide broadcast of the In Wheel Time car talk show. Did you like the way I melded that yeah, in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just ahead, we're going to talk amongst ourselves, and we're also going to talk with Mike Quincy, Consumer Reports. And, about, his, and his blue suede shoes. I don't know if the Mike's got blue suede shoes, but we're going to find out. And um, we're going to talk about the reliability study that Consumer Reports has done. It'd be interesting. Oh, boy. It is going to be interesting. I, I took a sneak peek. It's a good <laughs> It's a it's good a, It's a good It's a good Yeah. Uh, so we're going to make some manufacturers probably angry at us. I Hold know my that. beer. Hold my beer. Watch this. So uh, we thank you for joining us today. Good morning to you. And howdy, along with Mike out of this world, Mars, King Conrad DeLong. We always need more Jeff Zekin. Mm-hmm. I'm Don Armstrong. Glad that you could join us on a beautiful Saturday morning here in the Houston, Texas area. It's a bit chilly, but the sun is out and it's a beautiful day. It's, it's going to be, be nice a beautiful the weekend. neighborhood. Yep, it truly is. Don's wearing his sweater. Mike Quincy is here with us from Consumer Reports. Mike, good morning. Hey guys, how's it going today? Well, very well, thank you, and thank you for joining us. I love, love, love Consumer Reports' most reliable or unreliable cars of uh of the current model year and uh, so i'm gonna let you kind of control how we go about this first of all let's let's talk about the parameters that you guys use do you test every single car or how, how do you come up with the reliability survey well consumer reports testing and our reliability information are really kind of separate we get our reliability data from consumer reports members and every every year we we put out a survey to our members we basically ask them uh in the last 12 months tell us about any problems that you had with your car uh whether it's something minor like squeaks and rattles or paint and trim or something major like the powertrain or electronic issues and they tell us about their experiences owning their cars we take this data and we give it to our super smart statisticians who come up with our reliability predictions for new model years and for this year's survey we have predictions uh for 2024 models that are based on the reliability of the last three years we have data on more than 330,000 miles and i love your enthusiasm for our reliability report because i have to say that not everybody is as excited as you. <laughs> <laughs> no i can only imagine uh that that you know most people i think would be pretty honest in their opinion as they report to consumer reports about their car now <laughs> l- let's 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 clarify here that these are new cars correct okay i mean we we have we have tons of data on on used cars because we we have survey information for for models from to the 2000 model year up to 2023 so it actually in some ways it's even better if you're in the market for a used car because we go way way back but you know right now we're just talking about about new car predictions uh in terms of reliability Gotcha. And how many people uh, participated in this, uh, your readers? Uh, we have, I think, last count is several million. I I actually don't have that number right in front of me right now. It's okay. I do know that, that 330,000 vehicles were included in the survey, wow. making it one of the largest of its kind. Um, but but I, I don't know the, the latest of subscriber count for Consumer Reports, but it's definitely in the millions uh, and like everyone in publishing, it's certainly not as robust as it used to be. And what kind of questions are asked of these people that participate? Well, we, we asked them about you know problems with their cars. We were talking about problem areas like engine, uh, electric motors, transmissions, uh, every component that can affect uh, the livability of, of a car. And um, and they 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 we, we look at, at the data and we look at sample sizes and when you have a good a goodly number of people saying the same thing about the same component about the same car that gives you an idea that it, it is statistically relevant that's easy for me to say um, 
uh, to, to come up with recommendations, either this car is reliable or we predict it will not be reliable. But all this data is purely what is input by your members talking about their three-year-old cars, up to three-year-old Correct. cars. Correct. Or their one-year-old car, their two-year-old car. I mean, you know, we, we, you know there's other surveys out there that, that, that talk about initial quality. You know, problems gone wrong in the first 30 days or right. 60 days. We usually think surveys like that are pretty ridiculous. It's a brand new car. Nothing should be going wrong in the first 30 days, for goodness sake. So initial quality doesn't mean as much to us at Consumer Reports as how is it holding up over one year, two years, three years and beyond. But you don't get any participation from the manufacturers in this as far as any data from them about percentage of component failures uh, of their fleet. No, the, the manufacturers do not weigh in in consumer reports surveys. But when we meet with manufacturers and we talk to them about our survey results, 98% of the time, 99% of the time, maybe, they know exactly what we're talking about. They oh, yeah. see their warranty claims. They know every weaknesses of, of their cars and their components. And, and, and so they're, they're generally not really surprised by just about anything that we publish. Right. Now, all, all of these cars, are they're not just gasoline engines. They're also hybrids. And I understand you looked at uh, EVs as well. Well, as, as EVs are becoming more popular and, and dare I say, almost mainstream, uh, we did get a lot of survey information on electric vehicles as well as plug-in hybrids. And one of the more interesting uh, anecdotes of our survey results is that we found that EVs have 79% more problems than, than models with internal combustion engines. Wow. Now, and, and, and you think, well, well that's, that's crazy because a lot of people are buying EVs these days. But then we looked a little deeper on the other electrification of, of models, and that's plug-in hybrids. They have 146% more problems. <laughs> so, but, but, I mean, in, in some ways, the logical way of thinking about it is, is most manufacturers are new to the EV world. They're new to the plug-in electric world. And so they haven't worked out all the bugs yet. The, the one, you know, kind of positive uh, uh, spot among EVs is, is Tesla. Um, but they've been at it longer. So it's kind of, you know, it kind of, kind of goes locked up here. So how do you filter out, and, and having been a field engineer for General Motors, I know what you're talking about, about we know, they know what's going on. How do you filter out the emotion of your members? You know, and I, and I say the emotion of the, your member, you know, I brought my car in to get it worked on, and the dealer screwed it up, and they worked on it three or four times, and I just wanted to hammer him. So I hammered him in a survey, and that's, you know, that, that's what I'm talking about, about the emotion of them. They found an opportunity to get somebody back by filling out a survey on them. How do you, how do you filter out that emotional response? Well, that, that's how it has to be statistically relevant, uh, statistically provable. Uh, if we have, you know, let's say 100 people own a Honda Accord and 99 of them are saying, it's been drop dead reliable. So it's not a problem. We have one person that says, "Oh, it was terrible. It broke in the first week." Oh, you know, it, it, you 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 learn to filter out the anomalies. But when you see a pattern, then that is you know, it's it's as as Consumer Reports lawyers say, it is defensible. Okay. <laughs> now now, as far as brands are concerned, that that's fairly straightforward. Do you get down a right? down to the actual cars that the brands make? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we, we, look, at, at, we look at reliability from a brand level as well as a, as a model level. And, and sometimes we, even within the models, there are trim lines that have certain options that will prove to be more problematic than, than others. Okay. So, so that, again, helps us to further uh, uh, slice and dice the information to help people make a good buying decision. But yeah, the, 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 the brand information is, is there's not a lot of uh, surprises this year in terms of, of who is dominating the, for the most reliable models. And they're all, you know, they're, they're mostly coming from Asia. We're talking about you know, Lexus, Toyota, Honda, Subaru, Mazda, and, and Kia having the more reliable models. But uh, one thing that's interesting is, is the Germans made a pretty good show this year with Mini Cooper, Porsche, and BMW also uh, making the top 10. And how many years has Consumer Reports been uh, doing this specific report? 
we have been doing automotive surveys, I believe, for about 60 plus years. But Consumer Reports as an organization has been in business since 1936. And, and how do you, having done this for so long, do you see kind of repeat uh, offenses, you know, that one brand has substantially more transmission issues than another, uh, another one has more suspension issues, and, and how do the manufacturers explain that over time? Well, that's that's a that's a great question. I, we definitely saw some patterns of failure for components. For example, uh, there is some Nissan uh, CVTs that ha- are problematic. Which, yeah, I know a lot of people have heard about that. There was a, a time when Subaru head gasket issues were also a, a consistent problem, um, but. But it isn't. It isn't so much that uh, a, a, a manufacturer is stuck with a bad legacy. For example, you look at Kia being in the top ten for most reliable brands. There certainly was a time when when Kia was wasn't even close to the top ten. Maybe not even midway through the whole brands. And they have worked hard to improve their reliability. Uh, and, and you know, when you look at, at, at BMW, I think they've also uh, looked at how they're doing things and improved a lot, also. So. Um, but, but yeah, there's some manufacturers like a Chrysler, uh, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen. Every year they seem to be terrible. And you almost wonder what is going on within the confines of, of those offices. You know, why, why can they seem not to figure out uh, the, the keys to good reliability? Right. What is there anything in the survey? Uh, you surveyed, uh, well, it shows up here as uh, 30 brands in all, Chrysler being at the very bottom of the list and Lexus being at the very top of the list. Is there anything in between there that kind of surprised you, kind of took you back and going, wait, what's going on here? Well, I, I think I think when you're, you know, when you're sort of rooting for the home team, you maybe you want Detroit to do better. Uh, I think Ford is kind of an interesting uh, cross section because there there are some models of the Ford lineup like the Maverick and the Edge that have proven to be pretty reliable. But on the other hand, they've also had some real stinkers in the last survey. The Ford F one fifty Lightning all electric pickup has been abysmal. The the Ford F one fifty hybrid pickup truck, which is a great truck, I love this truck so much, is also turned out to be super unreliable. So, so you, you, you sometimes you can look at, at, at reliability from a brand level and you say, well, I don't know which Subaru I want, but I know most of them are pretty reliable. Or you get down to the model level. And, and you, it, it's, it, I guess t- in today's consumer, it, it isn't so much just to be loyal to one brand. You say, well, my, my father brought she- bought Chev- Chevrolets, my uncle brought Chevrolets, so I'm going to buy a Chevrolet. I don't think it's that easy, and I don't think that's a good use of people's money. And then again, how do you manage the recalls that are issued when you look at, you know, some of these manufacturers have recalled every car they've sold for six or seven years? And how does that impact on the reliability scores that you guys are ranking? Well, recalls are actually not a part of Consumer Reports reliability because most recalls uh, are a one time event. In other words, the manufacturer is saying we've got a problem. You bring it to us. We're going to fix it. It's not going to cost you any money, and usually it's done. Um, now, now, you know, the, the, so so that that in in and of itself is not a factor to make something unreliable. I mean, okay. You think about how many millions of cars were affected by the Takata airbag recall. Uh, yeah, this is a like a global thing. It doesn't mean that every every car that has one of those defective airbags is a completely unreliable car. But you fix the airbag, and you really don't have any issues. Okay. Is there is there anything in the bottom half of the list that is consistently at the bottom half of the list year after year? Uh, pre- pretty much Jeep. Jeep, <laughs> which, which is which is too bad. I mean, uh, listen, Christ, Stellantis uh, redesigned the, the the Grand Cherokee. It actually did really well in our testing, and so it's it's too bad that it's turning out to be really unreliable. Uh, the, the the Grand Cherokee, the Grand Cherokee L, uh, the Wrangler are are all come in pretty low in Consumer Reports reliability surveys. And what's interesting is that some of these Jeep models, you know, fly in contrast 
to Consumer Reports owner satisfaction surveys. I mean, people that buy a Jeep Wrangler love them, but they're also being honest with how unreliable they are. So, you know, I, I, I tip my hat to the Consumer Reports members that are that are telling us all about their model. Yes, I really like it, but no, it really is a pain in the neck. So, but look, could their use, that's an off-road vehicle, could them taking it off-road impact that? I mean, is there any accountability or allowance for that? Um. That's that's a good question, Mike. I I don't I don't think that's it, it is like I abused the vehicle off road and there and it broke so it's unreliable. I I don't think really that's a factor. I mean, when you look at at some of the Wrangler's problems, uh, you know, it might be electronic issues that have, really have nothing to do with off road hardware per se. Okay. Um. But 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 I think it's a fair question. In other words, how how is this car driven? And, and if, for example, when you think about how uh, the owners of most minivans. Yeah, you know that they're probably suburban parents that that aren't you know abusing their car, and so there's some minivans that are really super reliable because they're not abused. Uh, you know, the same thing you could be say thing about about sports cars. Maybe people drove the wheels off it, and they say, "Well, it's not reliable because it broke because I broke it." So <laughs> you know, whether it is the owner's fault or 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 inherent in in the way that the vehicle was designed or manufactured, that's usually what our statisticians can sniff out. And and, with, and within your survey um, componentry, you know, have you noticed that there's a higher or a lower level of automated uh, safety devices that are that are ticking that uh, that uh, survey as far as uh, problems with all the cameras and high tech uh, uh, computers and stuff that are on the vehicles? We're not seeing a wide. Uh, amounts of those kinds of failures unless they fall under general electronics. Electronic failures are among the the most cited trouble spot in consumer report surveys of, of, of you know examples of people that were they're having problems. But you know it it, it, it I, I would have to dig into that a little deeper to get a, a proper answer for your question because it, because it might fall under electronics, but I'm not aware that these safety features are are failing. I am aware, though, that that they they cost a fair amount to replace. Yeah. So you know, all the sensors, all the cameras, all the stuff that you're talking about, when you get into like a, a, a simple like fender bender in a parking lot, it can cost a whole lot of money to fix all that stuff. Oh yeah, just for all the recalibration yeah, of everything. Stuff you can't even see. Mike, Mike, let me ask you about Lexus. They are consistently at the top of the list. Not the top all the time, but right up there in the top five or so. What is it about Lexus? What are they doing so right that the others are always chasing? I think there's so much legacy with with Toyota. You know, obviously, you know, starting the luxury brand Lexus in the in the late '80s, early '90s, and Toyota is consistently also an a super reliable manufacturer. I think what Toyota and Lexus do is they get a technology and they stick with it. They have a 2.5 liter four cylinder engine that they put in a lot of models. They have a hybrid system that they have been working on and perfecting for like 25 years. So they're not bringing in the latest tech. They've been reluctant and and rather slow actually to get into the whole EV uh, area. Uh, because first of all, I don't, I don't think they see it as being very profitable, but also it's not in their expertise. So, so they're very slow to kind of embrace new technology and most likely they're going to, uh, test it out in their home market before they bring it to the United States. The Prius was, it was a thing in Japan before it came to the U S and over time that model has become just an incredible legacy of amazing reliability for what is a very complicated car. But Toyota has, you know, gets their technology down and they generally stick with it. Mike, uh, where can our followers get more information on this study? Is it consumerreports.org? Consumerreports.org. And, you know, if you're old school, we still sell magazines. We have <laughs> Consumer Reports new and used car buying guides. You can check them out in your supermarket. If you can find a newsstand, <laughs> it's also there. We do we do paper. But, yeah, certainly the trend is uh, is all digital all the time. Well, we certainly appreciate you guys, and uh, we, we love talking to you. And, and it, great survey. And this comes out once a year, does it not? That, that is correct. And, and you know, we have this new survey information 
you know, right around December. And then we're also working on our April issue, which is the big car issue of Consumer Reports, which should debut sometime in February. So uh, that'll be another uh, a reason to to come on in, in real time and, and talk it up. Absolutely. And we're going to invite you. Just let us know when that comes out and you're ready to talk. We'll get you on. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Mike you. Quincy, Consumer Reports in the Automotive Reliability Study. And they do such a great job because they're not influenced by advertising. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they it's just pure data that they supply information on. I, yeah. I, you know, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I do. respect it, too. All right, time now for the events calendar here on In Wheel Time. And Conrad has events coming up. Well, um, Houston Cars and Cocktails at Sawyer Park Ice House in the Woodlands. Wait a minute. Is, now that's a cruise in. Is uh, January 14th. Uh, the Winter Conroe Swap Meet and Car Corral, February 16th through 18th at the Montgomery County Fairgrounds in the air, uh, off of Airport Road. Um, Stephanie Nichols' 13th annual car and plane show in, at the Georgetown Airport. Is car February, and plane show. You know, I like it. Yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, February 24th at the Georgetown Airport. Um, the 11th annual Rouse Rock and Rides at Guptum Stadium oh, is March 2nd. Guptum Stadium. The uh, CCA Honda Go Acura. Uh, at the Conclave uh, in the Colleen Special Events Center is uh, April 13th. Um, January 14th is Savage Sunday Exotic Car Show in the Heights. So, you know, you want to go see some You edited cars. that on the fly, didn't you? Which? Your, 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 your events calendar. No, not at all. You didn't? Huh, because we started off as a cruise in, and I'm just calling you out. I'm just uh, jacking with you, really. <laughs> And that, well, you know, you want cruisins is tomorrow. Well, I know, is, but we're we're not there yet. Okay. That, that's another feature that we have later on in the show. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, thank Welcome. you for participating. Back to you, John. <laughs> 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 All right, Mister Mars Please, got a chance you. to review the new Ford Bronco. We're waiting to hear what you got to say, Mike. I, I have to say right up front. I got the most comments on this vehicle than any vehicle I've ever driven, including the Hellcats and stuff. I mean, it just people recognize this vehicle. It is so well done with this heritage model. Now, this is the 2023 Ford Bronco. It is the heritage edition. And this is the two-door model. It is a truck-based SUV. You can get seven different models of the Bronco. This is the sixth generation of it. It's part of it. But this version, they've got two different levels of the Heritage, and it is a four-passenger vehicle. It is two-door, just like you remember them. And it, it, they've just done it extremely well to make it look the same, but it is obviously much bigger. The one I had came with race red, so it had the white removable top, had the uh, white grill, the white 17-inch wheels on it, and it just really well done. Had LED headlamps up front that are automatic, high beams. The wheels are a 17-inch Oxford white aluminum wheel that's made to look like the old steel wheels. Just really nice looking. Now, when you get to the inside of this vehicle, again, this is a four-passenger model. They don't even try and make it a five. We had the plaid cloth seats. They're very supportive. The front buckets are heated. The split rear seats that fold are also um, they're also folded in, in the plaid cloth. We had the 8-inch center stack in the front, and it was... You know, it's always nice to have it a little bit bigger, but this one was very good. And the dash on it, we had the white dash all the way across. It almost looks like it's plastic. It's not, but that's part of that heritage look that goes with it. Now, we also had the 8-inch uh, digital uh, screen for the driver to have all the controls and all the information that the driver needs there. And uh, locking glove box on it. We had the grab handles. One thing I wanted to note, the grab handle coming in off the passenger side because it is set up. It is a lifted type vehicle. It's up on the console close to the center stack. It's a reach. It's not up on the pillar where you would think it would be like in a lot of Ford vehicles. So it's, it, my wife found it a little inconvenient. It worked, but it would have been so much easier and better if it had been up there uh, on the pillar. Now up under the hood, it, we had the 2.3 liter EcoBoost, 300 horsepower, 325 pound feet of torque. Now, there is a V6 option that'll get you 330 horsepower. Main thing about the V6 is the 415 pound feet of torque. Now, I 
I drove this. It has. We were backed by a seven-speed manual transmission. I think it's got more than enough power to go. A any manual place you transmission. It took first when I first got in it. It was dark and I wasn't looking, and I went down there and pushed on the brake and I hit the start button and it wouldn't start. And then I realized it was a manual, so I had to have the clutch everything in. So it was very unusual to get into one that's new from the factory. So the EPA says you should be looking for 16 in the city, 18 on the highway, with combined about 17. I happen to get across 301.5 miles, 19.2 miles very to the gallon in this thing. Mm-hmm. And I was very impressed with that. And like I say, it has more than enough power. I don't really know why you would want Did you that rev it up V6? to like 7,000 RPM nah. before you shifted it? Nah. Nah. No point. I mean, it, that's I not what that vehicle's made for. It, it, so, but I, I wish there was some place around where we could do a little rock crawling or something. You know, the only thing we got is a little mud and a little sand. And, and again, I don't know why you would want a V6 in this vehicle. I think the inline four has got plenty of power. Now, uh, driving this vehicle out on the road, it's got a little bit of noise. It's got a pl- removable hard top on it. The doors are where you can take them all off. So there's a little more road noise, but it's a little bit heavier and it's bigger, I think, than a lot of its competitors. So it rides surprisingly well with those 17 inch of those big tall tires on it. That part of that's because it's got an independent front suspension, which helps with the steering and everything. Um, now, the pricing on it. Now, this is based – the heritage model that we had is based on a mid-trim level. There is another one that's based on the upper uh, top-of-the-line model. It will cost you another twenty twenty-five grand. But the base model for a Bronco, according to the press kit, because the Monroney doesn't have any pricing on this vehicle, uh, pre-production type vehicle. But from the press kit, 34245 is where you can start on a Bronco. Now, the one we're driving, the heritage model – Starts at $44,305, which really surprised me for what I was driving. The best I can tell, the Heritage model is going to start at about 49000 trying to figure out what all was on it and what wasn't on it and put it in there. So sub-50 is what I would think. If you want the uh, top-of-the-line model, it's sixty six five, but that's based up there with the Raptor. The only real competitor I thought was applicable was the Jeep Wrangler, and I found a Sahara for forty five nine twenty five, so about in that same range of forty nine fifty thousand. And I think if you're looking, uh, you really need to go look at this. Particularly, like I say, if you like, I like the it. old school Bronco, I like it a lot. Definitely. Well, I will tell you at. that I, you know, Ford loaned me uh, one of those. It was a yellow with the white wheels mm-hmm. and white top. It was I loved it, and uh, I. I was very thankful that I got a chance to drive it from Chicago up to Wisconsin and back. And um, it was it was great. And I've already reviewed that. And I said the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was a great. Now, mine didn't have the manual transmission. It was automatic, but whatever. Yeah, I probably wouldn't go for the manual just because if I was rock crawling or something in the sand, you know, the manual's a little bit tougher than the automatic. But, again, and surprisingly, most of the comments I got were from women. I could hear it, you know, windows down. I'd be going by, like, left oh, the grocery I like store. That, Mike. Oh, look oh, at that Bronco. My. You know, with a, Oh, yeah. hi, Mike. <laughs> no, no, they were saying, like that. isn't that Bronco Billy? <laughs> <laughs> hey, this program is available 24 7 on iHeartRadio. Just look for In Wheel Time Car Talk. We also video stream on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and InWheelTime.com. 30 minute podcasts available from your favorite podcast provider. The In Wheel Time Car Talk show <laughs> continues right after this quick break. You own a car you love. Well, why not let Gulf Coast Auto Shield protect it? Houstonian John Gray invites you to his state-of-the-art facility to introduce you to his specialist team of auto enthusiasts. We promise you'll be impressed. Whether you're looking to massage your original paint to a like-new appearance, apply a ceramic coating, install a paint protection film, nano-ceramic window tint, or new windshield protection called ExoShield, Gulf Coast Auto Shield is where Houston's car people go. Curbed your wheels? Instead of buying new, why not have them repaired? How about a professionally installed radar detector? Gulf Coast Auto Shield does that, too. Get a peek inside the shop and look at the services offered by getting online and heading to GCAutoShield.com. Better yet, stop by their facility at 11275 South Sam Houston Tollway, just south of the Southwest Freeway, and get a personal tour. Gulf Coast Auto Shield is your place to go for all things exterior. Call them today, 832-930-5655 or GCAutoShield.com. 
The original group of Loopy Tortilla Restaurants will have you telling your family and friends just what the original recipes mean when it comes to the best fajitas in Southeast Texas. Founder Stan Holt invites you to visit the original Loopy Tortilla near I-10 and Highway 6. Here's the original house that inspired the design of all the rest and the original charm that helped make Loopy Tortilla the go-to destination for Houston Tex-Mex. Speaking of original, nothing can compete with the original lime pepper marinade that everyone will agree makes Loopy Tortilla award-winning beef fajitas the best anywhere. Loopy Tortilla Katie is another location that gives you the same quality and service Houstonians have come to expect at Loopy's. It's located just off I-10 of the Grand Parkway at Kingsland Boulevard in Katy. Find yourself in Aggie Land? Head to the Loopy Tortilla and College Station, located just around the corner from Kyle Field. It's a great place to enjoy those famous frozen margaritas before or after the game. Headed east to Louisiana? Stop in at the Loopy Tortilla in Beaumont. It twos on I-10. You can't miss it. The original group of Loopy Tortilla restaurants invites you in for the best Tex-Mex anywhere. That's it for this podcast episode of the In Wheel Time Car Show. I'm Don Armstrong, inviting you to join us for our live show every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and our InWheelTime.com website. Podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart Podcast, Podcast Addict, TuneIn, Pandora, and Amazon Music. Keep listening, and we'll see you soon.